Now, Franklin Roosevelt, I want to discuss a little bit of the background. Franklin Roosevelt gets a lot of credit as a friend of the workers in the history books for the New Deal during the depression of the 1930s. Union rights, social security, unemployment insurance, federal jobs programs such as the Works Progress Administration and other benefits for the workers. But this is how the ruling class tells the story. Now Roosevelt was rich through and through. Not one of the 1 percent, but one of the .0001 percent. His family got its fortune from the opium trade with China. Now doesn't that sound gentlemanly? They were involved in the opium trade. More accurately, they were big time drug dealers. The 19th century, in the 19th century, the imperialist countries fought several wars against China for the so-called right to sell drugs to China. Drug wars that made Roosevelt, the Roosevelt family, rich and happy. Today, you can go to prison for many years for selling drugs by the gram, especially if you were African American. But if your family got rich selling drugs by the ton, you get to buy houses on Park Avenue or the French Riviera, and maybe you get to be president, like Franklin Roosevelt. Now, the New Deal didn't come from Roosevelt's love for the working class. It came from his love for the ruling class and his hope that some concessions would stave off the developing class struggle. Their thinking is, will concessions weaken the struggle or encourage the struggle? How to divert the struggle? Of all their weapons, the cops, the courts, the media, the army, the National Guard, the biggest prop of capitalist rule is racism. And the ruling class never stops trying to foment racism through its hiring practices, the media, the repressive forces, every way they can, because they know that a united working class can be more powerful than all their weapons combined. We study history to apply the lessons of the past to the struggles of today. The basic tenets of Marxism were paid for by the blood of working class martyrs, and we honor them by remembering the lessons they can teach. The great lesson of the San Francisco strikes in 1934 is anti-racist solidarity was the key to winning concessions that long seemed impossible. This solidarity was achieved by long, hard, patient organizing and anti-racist agitation by class conscious workers, socialists and communists among the dock workers. We need to briefly review the situation of the working class during the depression of the 1930s. The ruling class has stolen working class history. Every past movement has demanded knowledge of its own history. The demand for African American history, women's studies, LGBT history are just a few examples of the hidden history that needs to come to light. The history of the multinational working class has also been stolen, distorted, and rewritten to serve the illusions comforting to the percent. It is no accident that the hardest information to find anywhere are concrete examples of anti-racist solidarity among the workers. The 1% likes it that way. This is what makes the struggle of the longshoremen and the general strike in San Francisco especially important. The history books call the 1920s the Roaring Twenties, a so-called golden age in U.S. history, but the gold only roared to the top. The 1% celebrates this age of racism, anti-unionism, and wish hunts of immigrants. Productivity surged in the 1920s, but one-tenth of 1% 1 of the population had a total income of more than the bottom 42%. Only a small percentage of the working class even worked a five-day week. The average work week was 55 hours in iron and steel, 54 in textiles, and 60, 60 hours for the average laborer. As today, about half the population was poor. It was worse for immigrants, mostly from Eastern Europe at the time, and even worse for African American families. In this period, the wages of African Americans was about one half that of the already low wages of white workers. Jim Crow discrimination was the law in the South, and open discrimination was rampant in the North. The Ku Klux Klan had over four million members. Lynching and other terrorist acts in the South were not uncommon and generally ignored by every level of government. The KKK also violently opposed immigration and union organizing, serving as company spies, thugs, and assassins of union organizers. In this period, strike after strike was lost. But the, nationally, the working class was no longer completely segregated. A half a million African Americans had moved north during and after World War I. By 1930, more than 25% of African American men were employed in industrial jobs, 
compared with only 7% in, in 1890. By the mid-1930s, African-American workers made up 20% of laborers, 6% of the workers in the steel industry, and one-fifth of the workforce in Chicago slaughterhouses were African-American. This was the situation for the working class when the stock market crashed in 1929 and things got even worse. $25 billion of stock value vanished overnight. Over 5,000 banks failed. Official unemployment soared to 25%. In response to the crisis, the capitalists cut wages by 45% on average. Many unemployed men left their families so that meager relief supplies would stretch further. Poor families from the Midwest migrated to California to work in the fields, while thousands of Mexican workers were deported en masse. The American Federation of Labor, the AFL, at the time did not oppose wage cuts, opposed unemployment insurance, practiced Jim Crow segregation, and joined Hoover in telling workers that prosperity is just around the corner. So that's where the labor movement was at at the time. Like today, when companies such as Target, McDonald's, and Walmart seem so difficult to organize, the bosses thought that in the factories and other workplaces, the workers were so easy to replace, especially during a depression, that they could never be organized. The conservative leaders of, leaders of the AFL agreed. They refused to organize industry-wide, relying on the old and outdated craft unions based narrowly on specific skills. Like today, the bosses felt confident that since the working class was divided, impoverished, and desperate for any jobs at all, they had found a permanent solution to labor troubles, what they called labor troubles. But the working class upsurge that was developing was to show that what, that once, what once seemed impossible was becoming inevitable. The workers were waking up. Despite the ravaging unemployment due largely to the patient organizing by socialist and communist workers, a labor upsurge and strike wave engulfed the country. The first sit down in the US was at the Hormel Packing Company in Minnesota in 1933. After the workers occupied the plant for only three days, the company agreed to recognize the union and bargain for better wages. The movement grew. In 1936, there were 48 different sit down strikes. In 1937, there were 477. For example, in Detroit alone, workers occupied every Chrysler factory, 25 auto parts plants, four downtown hotels, nine lumber yards, 10 meat packing plants, 12 laundries, and two department stores. That was just one place in Detroit. The developing mood of the working class also affected the docks in San Francisco, where many strikes had been lost, union drives broken up, organizers blacklisted, where the ship owners felt, like the industrial union bosses, like the industrial bosses, that since during the Depression, desperate workers would easily replace striking workers, and the solidarity required for unionization was impossible. On the West Coast waterfront, earlier strikes were broken by repression and scabs. In 1919, longshoremen struck for better conditions and wages, and the owners overwhelmed the strike with scabs, and the Teamsters had continued to deliver goods. Dock workers suffered under ever-increasing speed-up. Shape-up meant intense competition for jobs between groups of workers. Shape-up is a system where workers stand and wait for a foreman to pick them for work, a divisive system run by the owners that breaks solidarity. How many workers here have faced shape-up in one form or another? I think a lot. Yeah. Particularly immigrant workers face that every day. 